Welcome to the Las Vegas Diocesan Conference 2022. <laughs> it's my honor and my pleasure to welcome our Bishop George Leo Thomas to officially open our conference. So Bishop, if you would please come forward. <laughs> For 28 years, I served as a priest and auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of Seattle, 17 of those years as Vicar General, and I'm counting on the Lord to commute my sentence in purgatory for those 17 years. <laughs> it was during that time that I spent an unforgettable evening with one of the greatest religious figures in modern times. I'm speaking of the late Cardinal Francis Nguyen Van Thuyn, the former Archbishop of Saigon, who was raised to the rank of Venerable on May 4th of 2017 by the Holy Father, Pope Francis. Archbishop Van Thuyn was visiting his niece and her family in Seattle, but he agreed also to speak to the thousands and thousands of Vietnamese Catholics, many of whom were refugees living and laboring in the Archdiocese of Seattle. During our dinner together, the Archbishop shared agonizing details about his life story, details that are etched in my mind and remain in my prayer. It was just eight years after he was ordained as a bishop. He was arrested by Viet Cong officials and charged as a conspirator against a brutal communist regime. He was held without trial as a prisoner of war. 13 years, nine of those in solitary confinement. That night it was clear to me that I was in the presence of a saint, a man small in stature, but clearly a giant in the church. His words revealed that he was willing to pay any price, even the ultimate price, for the sake of Christ and for the people he loved so deeply. In the prime of his life, age 48, he was spirited away under the cover of darkness and placed in the hold of a ship with 1,500 other prisoners. And from there, he and his fellow prisoners were transported to a remote prison in North Vietnam. That night, in the hold of the ship, he renewed his commitment to God, and he prayed these words, and I quote, I will trust you, Lord, knowing you will send someone else to do the work in my diocese, perhaps another even more capable than I. The prison will become my cathedral, these are now the people you have given me to care for, and this will be my mission, to ensure your presence among them, my despairing and miserable brothers. It's your will I'm here, and I accept that will, O Lord. From that night forward, the Archbishop said a deep sense of peace filled his heart, a peace that remained with him for the duration of his confinement. That night at table, I asked him, Archbishop, were you able to celebrate Mass while you were in prison? His answer, yes, but not without peril. During those years, his family sent him small quantities of wine, ostensibly medicine to ease his stomach pain. But this so-called medicine was sacramental wine, which he held in the palm of his hand as a chalice. Also, the tiny hosts were smuggled in month after month by a friendly guard concealed in an empty flashlight. It was in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament that miracles began to take place before their eyes. Fellow prisoners, some of whom already Catholic, took turns at night 
to adore the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. But also Buddhists and non-Christians were converted to the faith by the example of this bishop and believing prisoners. Many of the guards who held him captive were also converted, so much so that the prison administration began to rotate out those guards on a regular basis. Archbishop tearfully described the conversion of one particularly brutal guard, a consummate communist, who after his conversion would arrive at work singing the Vene Creator Spiritu. He told us, through the power of the Lord, present in the Blessed Sacrament, the darkness of the prison became bathed in light, and the fragile seeds of faith quietly germinated and bore fruit before their eyes. Deprived of freedom, he said, and living in poverty, I was at peace. It was precisely there, in the face of darkness and desolation, that the ministry of the Eucharistic Jesus took on its fullest meaning. In the midst of hopelessness, souls were saved because in the words of Cardinal Nguyen Van Thun, the love of Jesus is simply irresistible. At our November meeting, the Conference of Bishops voted on and approved a national Eucharistic revival with the ultimate purpose of renewing and transforming the Church by renewing our relationship with Jesus Christ in the Most Holy Sacrament of the altar. I believe with all my heart that as we come to grasp the beauty of Christ's real presence in the Eucharist, our own lives and the lives of our people will be transformed because the love of Christ is so irresistible. As I have given this Eucharistic revival considerable thought and prayer, I now envision five hopes for the Diocese of Las Vegas, five goals that I hope we can reach together as we intentionally claim and reclaim and proclaim the beauty and the power of the Church's most priceless treasure. The first, that you and I will do all in our power to ensure that the Eucharist is indeed the source and summit of all we are and do, the wellspring of our respective apostolates, the heartbeat of our individual lives, and the lifeblood of the diocese and our parish communities. In 2018, during my installation at the shrine, I said, we are a Eucharistic people. How did the disciples on the road to Emmaus come to know Jesus? But through the breaking of the bread. Therefore, in the Diocese of Las Vegas, I beg you that all we are and all we do must begin at the altar and return there in prayerful thanksgiving and praise. The first goal is intended to make our ministry and indeed our very lives Christocentric by being Eucharistically centered. The second, in response to this revival, it's my hope that our teaching and our preaching at every level will convey to our people that the Church's hallowed belief is simple and, and profound, that Jesus Christ is truly present, not merely in symbol, but in the Eucharist, he is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Not symbol, but truly present. The Eucharist, in the words of St. John Paul, is described as inestimabile donum, the Church's most priceless gift. It was in the 13th century, the angelic doctor Thomas Aquinas wrote a number of hymns at the prompting of the Pope to teach the lay faithful of the Lord's real presence in the Eucharist. He wrote powerful hymns, Adoro te devote, Latens de etas, 
Devoutly I adore you, O hidden deity. My whole heart submits to you, and in contemplating you, surrenders itself completely. I beg preachers and teachers in this diocese to take particular note that it is charismatic preaching and charismatic teaching that will help to open the eyes and the hearts of the lay faithful, because faith first comes through hearing. The Eucharistic Lord ever present, Panis Angelicus, the bread of angels, the Lord of our lives, and the center of all we are and all we do. The third goal includes the whole community, but directs special attention on the ordained clergy. It is ours celebrandi. The art of celebration must mark the life of every priest celebrant. The ars celebrandi must be intentional and conscious, marked by careful and prayerful preparation each time you celebrate the Holy Mass. In the words of Father Paul Turner, who spoke to us last year, the Ars Celebrande is knowledgeable and inspirational. It grasps the Church's heritage and gives it personal expression. The art of celebration ensures that habit, routine, torpor, and perfunctory celebration will have no place in our community. The art of celebration leads the faithful to the Eucharistic heart of the Lord. Ars Celebrande will be our shared undertaking and our common commitment as we move into the future together. Number four, I articulated in my installation homily some four and a half years ago what I called the theology of the ampersand, connecting liturgy and compassion, sacrament and service, prayer and justice, word and action, or in the parlance of sacred scripture, love of God and love of neighbor. The Holy Father, Pope Francis, has strongly admonished the clergy to leave the comfort of the sacristy and the security of the sanctuary in order to bring the gospel to the peripheries with special solicitude toward those who live and labor on the margins of society. Missionary discipleship must be centered on the Eucharist and draw its life from the Eucharist, committed to bringing the transforming light and the grace of the Eucharistic Lord into the very heart and soul of the community. This is our fourth hope during the years of revival. And finally, goal five is simple and uncomplicated. The fathers of the council called for the full, active, conscious participation of the lay faithful in every Eucharistic celebration. There are to be no passive bystanders or casual onlookers as the church prays her greatest and most efficacious prayer. Well-formed, empowered, and involved lay ministry is a sine qua non in the celebration of Holy Eucharist. Prayerful music, powerful proclamation, and well-trained well ministers at the altar greatly enhance this goal of becoming a Eucharistic people. Francis has articulated this vision over and over again in his Sunday and Wednesday addresses as he encourages the whole church to walk together as companions of the Eucharistic Lord. This is synodality at its best. Dear friends, the Diocese of Las Vegas is all in with the Eucharistic revival, applauding it as a major way to discover or to rediscover the unfathomable presence of the Eucharistic Lord in our midst. The words of Cardinal Luen Van Thun set the stage for these years of revival together. The love of Jesus is irresistible. I say it again. The love of Jesus is irresistible. 
dear members of my diocesan family, let's take on these initiatives together. I beg you, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. <laughs>